cool. How's it? Morning, 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 morning. Um, I don't know what it is about public speaking, but fuck, every time it makes you just want to puke. <laughs> I cannot tell you. <laughs> you know, you sit there and you, you, you just imagine every terror on earth, you know, it's to note or not to note or to remember or not to remember or what the fuck, I don't actually know anymore. I've been going through this artistic slump, so I've taken five days off and I've been sitting at home with a fire and all those kind of gorgeous things like DSTV and, you know, the Joy Luck Club. But <clears throat> what's happened is I've, I've had the opportunity to overanalyze this fucking thing so far <laughs> that I really don't know where to start. But what I want to share with you is I want to share with you the things that I've learned. What's inspired me about talking here today is that I've had this opportunity to go and learn things and to go and observe things on the internet and, and watch documentaries and other lectures and when the subject of creativity came up and all I learned about was everything that wasn't creativity. Um, in the, you know the major things and I've, I've kind of broken my notes into three parts here one is um, things that I have to remember and things I have to remember and all the cuck in the middle so we're going to start with the things that I have to remember finish with the things that I have to remember and wade our way through the middle at some point what, what the things that I've learned I believe that success is the role and um, the path of everybody I believe primarily in that we all have the ability to achieve greatness no matter what our path or our previous journey has been. Um, I have learned that vulnerability and weakness are the birthplace to creativity, innovation, and change. In a very beautiful lecture by Brené Brown on TED Talks, that creativity and suffering are intrinsically linked and the essential part to creativity is not to be afraid to fail. I grew up in the southern suburbs. My mom was a school teacher, a nursery school teacher. My dad was an accountant and an African adventurer. Um, I had a very beautiful life. We were three children, all three of adoption. Um, I very sadly lost, we very sadly lost my brother later on into the story, but that's all cool. And um, I was a semi-privileged family. My mother and father worked extremely hard to put us into a private school, um, which was the Steiner School in Constantia and Michael Oak in Kenilworth. And um, it was an amazing, I had a beautiful and idyllic upbringing with music and education and drama and all that kind of cuck. <coughs> I then found my inner fairy at the age of 13 when things started to go very, very much pear-shaped. And um, um, <laughs> one of the byproducts was that I was booted out of school. I never finished. Um, I just scraped my standard eight. And the one thing I found on this journey was I found the hospitality industry and I found food. <clears throat> um, it was quite a tragic part of my life. I... Um, had an affair with a very, very much older, very, very older person, and it all ended up in drama and heartache and a few other bi beautiful byproducts of life. And um, food was the one thing that kept me together, and it kept me, um, it, my creativity and c cooking kept me safe. It was the one anchor that I had for this, for this, as a base for this journey that I've taken over the last 26 years. <coughs> um, what else was there? Okay, now we're in the middle bit. Um, <laughs> for fuck's sake. All right. Um, I ran away. So I ran away from home. Uh, 13 years old, nervous breakdown, 16. Um, hit the road, traveled around the world. Um, got very, very naughty, um, which was fantastic. But the one thing that I did is um, I cooked. I always, always cooked, and I always believed in the power of people and the power that things do come right, no matter how bad they do seem at certain times. Um, I've spent, you know, the last 27 years working within the hospitality industry, and I know that, you know, today I'm supposed to be speaking about creativity and all that kind of cack, but I know that none of you really want to know about that. You want to know about bankruptcy and <laughs> am I really this dodgy cunt that everybody thinks I am? <laughs> so we will, get, we, will, we will brush on all those things. <laughs> I... I was very fortunate much later to go to England to study and I did my master's there in food and, and chocolate, specializing in chocolate and cuisine and returned to Cape Town and South Africa to work in the, in the hotel industry 
where I found there was so much unhappiness and despondency within the workplace, and I, I truly believed there was a better way to run businesses. It was at this point that um, I fell in love, and I opened this thing called Madame Zingara, who I primarily refer to as my first wife. <laughs> Zingara, we started as a, a building in Loop Street, as everybody know. I then <clears throat> apparently torched it to the ground, stole all the money and moved to Costa Rica. <laughs> but <laughs> it didn't really happen that way. <clears throat> um, I faced liquidation the first time round in 2006 with the fire. I then um, went overseas and abroad to a, a family where I'd seen these very beautiful tents, and I begged them for their help and their support. And we ended up bringing out the Theatre of Dreams to South Africa. Had we done it? No, we hadn't. And did we know what we were doing? No, we didn't. Um, did we believe that we could do it? Yes, we did. We believed that, I believed that um, if we took all these people and we put them together, that everything would be fine, that everything would be okay. And it's that primary belief that has enabled us as a company and as a group of people to continue to create and develop work in this beautiful country. Um, the tent, of course, then big dreams and all that. We went to London and everything fell on its head. Um, one of the, the lessons that I learned in my journey coming here today was this rule that we need to learn to accept and look at, us, look at our failures as accomplishments that <clears throat> we need to own our responsibility in things. I could stand here and I could tell you about my dodgy partners, I could tell you about the 2009 financial crash, I could tell you a whole lot of things. Or I can just stand here and tell you that it broke my heart. That feeling when you are unable to rise up and to support your people, to look after this child, this, this child of love which you call your company, and to be in that situation of helplessness and fear where you have no answers and it is only black light in front of you. I own that. That's mine. It's my responsibility and it's my journey. And it was a journey that we've taken together as a group of people. And it's been a heartbreaking and very emotional ride. With that came a million other stories, you know, again, I'd stashed all the money in Costa Rica and I'd done a whole lot of fucking other things I don't even want to know. And at the same time, my personal life was highly publicized and that was falling apart. And, you know, in these moments of great darkness, incredible, incredible gifts come to us. Beautiful, beautiful stories start to emerge. People come from all over the place to put out their hands and hold you. Marco here, one of them, thank you. And the thing is, is that we took some time out, was the first thing that we did. I went and laid on a couch and watched the entire series of brothers and sisters from one end to the fucking other and back again. It was <laughs> fantastic. I don't usually have that amount of time, you know. <laughs> and um, a client of ours, uh, Charles Geffen, came and um, his brother had owned the, the Bombay, which was then Amigos, and he gave that store to us and said with the line that he didn't agree with what had happened, and here is a gift. Unfortunately, uh, there was not this big pile of money in Costa Rica that I could just whip back and, and open it. And the Bombay, we opened on a, on a whole lot of love, and it has emerged into a, a wonderful uh, operation and a beautiful, beautiful store. Um, from there, we went on to Sidewalk. And with time, I knew that I had to get back on my horse. I had to start working back in the fields where I was where what had ended off after um, the UK affair. Um, <clears throat> uh, have we done bankruptcy? Do you want more of it? <laughs> <laughs> when when I, d I look around and, and I observe what's going on in our country and I, s I see the pain and the suffering and the economy and all these kind of things, I also begin to realize that it's not only me and it's not only us. Um, 
it's not only the staff of Zingara that have been through these kind of journeys that three quarters of our country has done the same. Our education is in a, is in a, in a state of, of collapse, our medical services, it carries on and carries on and it carries on. Um, and we're all so conscious of it. And as I start to tie in my ownership to my own failure, I also have to tie myself into ownership of my country's, um, my country's failure too. At the moment, in terms of creative content, we're busy working on three big jobs. One is the return to Loop Street with a project called Shake Your Honey Mumbai. Um, a lovely little Indian tale of chaos and debauchery, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> a, a very beautiful organic garden in the city. Uh, the Rani is a farm project, which is a collaboration job between the city of Cape Town and uh, Cheryl Lazinski and a few other players within the area. Um, and the other thing that I would like to speak to you today about is the building of a Department of Education and Skills Development Center that we are busy working with in the city of Cape Town. <clears throat> in my journey, what I've, I've observed is that there is, so much, there is so much work to be done. There is an unbelievable amount of work to be done within our country and within our chosen fields of occupation. Um, there is this huge divide between um, business and individual. There's a huge divide between skill and, and no skill. And what we're trying to embrace at Madame Zingara now is to find a more rounded approach to the way that we work and the way that we work with our people. <coughs> there is an apathy, there is a great sadness that comes with staff. Um, there are these huge barriers in between achieving greatness and, and who you are at present now. And, and what I would like to work with is I'd like to try and work with structures and principles where we can try and round out the way that we run our companies to bridge the relationship between financial strength and poverty, so to speak. Um, we've been working on this for about two years now. It's been hours and hours of research and hours and hours of workshops and skills development and talks and forums and all kinds of shit <clears throat> in order to understand what we're working with, where the primary pr problem came to me, which was, how do I make somebody on minimum wage care? As we've grown our organization, <clears throat> the distance between myself and the operation or the kitchen, the, the heart of our, our organization has increased due to, fuck, a big head office in the sky and all this other cuck that comes with running a business, which is very, very boring, I must admit. But what's happened is that from having this daily contact with um, our staff and our people, we've moved further and further away from a sense of identity about what we're trying to achieve or what we're trying to build. <clears throat> Over the last two years, we've seen um, an unbelievable shift in, in our organization. We've always employed in um, very weird sectors of the market. We like midgets and drag queens and, uh, you know, the strange people in life. And <laughs> we, we've gone in there, you know. And what we've seen, though, is that we've seen is that there's this left, there's this forgotten it's a forgotten generation. It's, it's your lower income staff member that's coming into an organization. And uh, what we're trying to find is we're trying to find a way that we can, through creativity and through skills, is that we can start to develop that person into what they can see as their own greatness to instill passion. We went in there. Um, we rolled up our sleeves. You know, Buddha says you need to walk the middle path. I don't like walking the middle path. It's fucking boring. <laughs> you know? so, <laughs> we just climb in there and get messy. And, and do we make a whole lot of mistakes? Hell, yes, we do. And are we employing the weird person to try and achieve greatness? Yes, we are, because that's, those, that's really the person that matters. People ask, how do we make magic? We make magic by putting the weirdest people we can on earth in the same room at the same time and turning up the music. <laughs> it works. <laughs> I promise. Every occasionally, Jar comes to visit us, you know. 
But it does work. It does work. And as we start to share our experiences on earth, so we too begin to grow. We started with um, uh, building a center called the Lotus Room, which is in the heart of, the, of the heart of Cape Town. And it was an open opportunity for our staff to come and talk. We employed um, a full-time counselor, um, the very beautiful Heidi. She's been with the company for many years, so she really has a good knowledge of what we're doing. And we opened up communication, a place to talk. Safe haven, place to talk. Outside of our formal head offices, we want to listen. We want to hear what you have to say. We want to hear, we want to absorb what you can give us in order to help our lives as leaders make a difference. Um, I need to tell you more about that bankruptcy thing because I need to tell you how I fucking did it, actually. <laughs> it's quite important. Anyway, so Lotus Center on the way. Um, and what we've achieved over the last two years is that we're finally getting to a point where we've been able to take a cleaner or a lower LSM count individual coming into a building, and we are now able to achieve greatness, where two of our stores out of the 14 operations that we've run in are now finally on black management. Um, from cleaner all the way through, they now do Facebook and Twitter. It's unbelievable. Um, <laughs> how things have changed, and we are getting to a point now where I finally see this thing called hope, <clears throat> where it's not, success is not exclusively somebody else's. It's something that we can all own, and it's something that we can all believe in. On the Chef Showcase this year, we had five of our kitchen staff apply for that, uh, 14 staff in total, five of them are from the skills development courses that we've been offering. And as we get to this point, we can now see a very clear path for the future. The crux of it is, is that we need to educate. I mean, it really is the fundamental. And I believe that as we work with education and mind work, not only skills within kitchens and, and practical cuck, um, that as we start to look at and address the way we think is actually where the shift starts to happen. It's assisting people with a modern thought process, which we are all so privileged to understand, and we get it. I mean, we get it because we grew up with it. We grew up with these things. Whereas, <clears throat> you, know, it, uh, you know, in some circumstances, the staff member might as well be from another planet. And although we sat with the computer sides of things and the practical applications, your Excels and your all that kind of stuff, we realized that it was actually the heart that needed more repairing to start with. <clears throat> After London, I came back to South Africa, and there was only two things that I had. I had my name and myself, which wasn't in very good tact, um, <laughs> and we had a logo. <clears throat> it was... <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. <clears throat> I took it up and I sold it to the side. Did I give up my child? Yes, I did. Why? Because I believed in the greater good. Finished. We had a 92% staff return rate. We went from shoving everybody into the Bombay Bicycle Club. We now employ over 350 staff, and I'm hoping by the end of the year we'll be cruising in at about 500. Um, we feed in off 2,500 people a day. Um, which is an incredible stat. Do I know what I'm doing? No, I never got my standard eight. Um, and somehow we seem to be getting on with it and getting through it. <clears throat> For me, what's going to be so beautiful over the months ahead is um, taking a company and transferring it from business all the way through to education with a campus that's going to be offering over 353 over 350 free courses for all our staff where we are going to be able to train, skill, patch up, and hopefully develop greatness all the way around us in this ambition to create an energy of hope. Creativity is what I believe is going to be the fundamental basic of how we're going to do it. It's going to be our tool that we work with by taking everything that we look at and turning it upside down so you're really putting it on your head <clears throat> and it's going to be a journey, I'm sure, where we're going to make fuckloads of mistakes. 
Um, I have no idea what it involves running a campus, um, but I do know that with 400 people, 450 people working in partnership with us, which are the staff of this company, that they will be able to show us the way. They will be able to tell us what we need to do in order to create a new environment for us to work. Yeah, that was about it, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, is it going to work? I don't know, you know. Is it going to make loads of money? No, it's not. Is it going to cost loads of money? Yes, it is. Um, you know, what is it? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I do, but what I do know is that if a company, if the company is going to achieve long-term sustainability and greatness, that we need to change the way we work and we need to take the money that we earn off our till points on a daily ma basis and we need to put it to good. It was what the company was founded with. Unfortunately, um, we're on our own. Um, Costa Rica <laughs> ain't doing any offering and, and over the last two years we've done nothing except take all the money that we've earned, save it and spend it on new development, staff growth and expanding of an operation. <coughs> Are we building an empire? No, we're not. I refer to it, it is a kingdom, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Finish. <laughs> okay. Empire strike back. They fuck the fuck out, okay? <laughs> I've done this one three times and <laughs> it's de most definitely a k kingdom. Kingdoms have queens. They have lovely things, you know. <laughs> they have fields and servants, and it's great out there. We love it. So empires we're not going to do. I really do have a vision of building a, uh, of building a kingdom. Um, I want to build a kingdom of good. I want to build a place which is safe and secure that every single staff member and every person that comes into an organization is touched with uh, a spirit and which is defined through the difference between right and wrong. Um, I want to expand on our staff accommodation facilities. I want to expand on our educational facilities. I want to expand into child services and all kinds of beautiful avenues that are available to us within our current market in South Africa. And in order to do this, we've got to build up the financial reserves in order to support it. So in answer to the question, are we buying up Cape Town? Yes, we are, but it is with good intent, I promise. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> How far does this journey go? How far does this vision go as artists? Um, we don't put limitations of ourselves. You know, in you know that I, we, you can always say you can't. You know, there's the big can't. I can't do this. I can't do that. We ban the word I can't. We we don't do the word I can't. Use, use the word I can't. Find another job. Find another company to go and work at. We use the word how can I or how can we? You with me? And we've totally removed the limitation of what we are capacitated to do. We choose our own journey. We've proved it. I've proved it. I've lived this incredible life of, of <coughs> you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, <coughs> clean, serene, and back up. The, you know, it's really been this incredible journey. And what we can see in this journey is that if you believe you can succeed. I mean, it really is the fundamental basic of everything that we're doing at Zingara is to create a belief structure where everybody is empowered to achieve a dream, where we are constantly feeding people with the energy of hope. <coughs> Do people fall on your heads? Are we going to fall on our heads? Yes, I'm sure we are. Are we going to get it right within the service industry in South Africa? I don't know. But what I do know that we are getting right is we have a 15% staff turnover, we're generating a payroll of over $2 million a month, and we're getting through it. How? I don't know. But you know what? It's working. Something within that system is working. Now's the stuff that I've got to leave you with. <laughs> What do I have to give? What do, what do we have to give each other here today? I think the most important thing that I'd like to give to all of us is that I believe that to succeed you have to believe. You, you have to believe with such a passion that it builds reality. That vulnerability and pain are the key ingredients and adversity is just the change that we have not yet adapted to.
our greatest fears and our greatest humiliations and our greatest tragedies in life are truly the things that define and make the silver lining. We would not be here today if um, we had not gone through this journey together as an organization. And um, I'm sure there are going to be many tragedies and many tears as we move forward over the years ahead. However, I feel if we just sit together honestly and we, we tell each other and we share and when these problems arrive, we go back to the table and start working together, I believe that these problems and tragedies really do become our shining light. <coughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, we have a couple of minutes left for a few questions. Um, at some point, we just have to cut it off, so I'm sorry about that. If anyone wants to leave now for work, you're welcome to go. If you have, have to be somewhere at 10 o'clock. Um, otherwise, yeah, just um, yeah, just have. A, if you have questions, please ask them. Richard, I just ask you to please um, just repeat them. Awesome. All right, apparently like, nobody asks us questions. <laughs> what do you want to know, man? Now's your opportunity. Come on. Oh, where is the money? <laughs> Investic. <laughs> Simple stuff, huh? Um, <clears throat> I don't get a lot of time to cook, you know. Um, I spend, you know, 18 hours a day at work or 14 hours a day at work and then four hours at home and stuff. So it's most of the time it's like everybody else. It's engine convenience food, you know. <laughs> 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 so disappointing. I know, I know. <laughs> <but> <laughs> Questions, guys? Yes. Yeah. I, th yeah. I think um, I'm supposed to repeat the question, but that was a really long question. <laughs> you know, Jesus. <laughs> yes, most definitely. Um, employ your friends. Employ the people that you want to spend time with. You're going to spend so much time with these folks that, um, it, I, yeah, man, work with people that you love, you know, really. Um, are there tragedies within the workplace? Yes, there are. Do we have, you know, great wars and all that kind of stuff? Yes, we do. Um, am I difficult? Yes, I am. They call me the heart-shaped puss. I mean, how the <laughs> fuck is that? You know what I mean? <laughs> You've got to love them, you know? You really do. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, you know, at some point I was like, oh God, you know, what am I going to say, you know, if they go at me at how, how hectic I can be? And it is really the crux, crux of it is, is that am I difficult and am I strong and am I very particular about certain things? Yes, I am. I'm very particular about the difference between right and wrong and I'm very particular about the relationship between two people when it comes to a contract or an agreement. Um, if the company makes mistakes, I'm very happy on behalf of the company to put my hand in the pocket. I, I have no problem with that. And you do have to have a hard line, you know. I mean, it's all very beautiful in the Richard Branson world, you know, when you read all his books and everything else. But somebody there has to be a puss. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> we... <laughs> you know what I mean? It's all just like, screw it, let's do it. And what a, what a, what a, you know. <laughs> So yes, employ the people that you love. Um, work with love. Well, do do everything that you want to do in life with love. You know, is is it a difficult journey to keep up that love? Hell yes. Is it? Are you going to get hit on your head? Hell yes. Is it going to be brutal and unkind? Hell yes again. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Flaky, flaky. It's flaky, flaky. Your brother. My love. Sure. 
Brother Ja and Brother Blake. <laughs> wow, man. Sure. Yeah, wow. Yeah, Blake is a very, very special member of staff. He came to us. He'd been living on a raster farm in the Eastern Cape. He hadn't been paid for about three years, and he was like, Irie, bro. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Pack your bags. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for thank you for lending him to us. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um yes, Iran is a city farm project. Um that is a very, very beautiful mission that has been spearheaded by Cheryl Lazinski. Um we were very fortunate to be in the position where we have been able to fund this project and this mission. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a thing. The finance at Madame Zingara is actually quite interesting because we don't do, you know, we took the brand out of liquidation and us, we sold it um, in order for us to pay all our debt was the deed of sale. Um, and they would get to keep me until the age of 40, which is in about 22 seconds. <coughs> We've had to expand that thought, but we get in there now. Um, and basically what I've been doing is I've been taking all the money that we've earned and I've put it aside, literally. Up until a year ago, we were very, very heavily involved in CSI and um, social development with Ecomva and Nicro. Um, and about a year ago, I said, okay, cool, there's a different way to do this. I, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of, I've tried, I'm tired of being an organization that writes out checks. <clears throat> which is when we started looking at our staffing and looking at all these things. <coughs> the Aranya's City Farm Project is an organic garden going into the top of town. The, I think the media launch for that is on the 17th, um, which is in a few days, few days' time. And it's a, it's, a, it's a JV. I mean, it's Stratvik, uh, South Africa. It's ourselves. It's the Ohio Watch. It's members from the community. Um, fully based cooperative system, so pilot project in the city. Um, is it going to work? I don't know. Are we going to try it? Let's, who the fuck cares, you know? <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, yeah, very, very, very cool mission. Um, I'm sitting with bated breath. I think it is will be incredible. I think it is something that we could take into other communities. Um, totally organic based, all div um, skills um, and education orientated with farm stores and cooperatives attached to it, which I think will be amazing. Um, owned and managed by the community for the community, which is very cool. Um, Loop Street, what am I doing at Loop Street? Uh, whoa. <laughs> um, I fell in love with India as part of my recovery. <coughs> and um, it's a, it's, a, it's a creative. Um, I wanted very much to go home. I had to sell loop the Loop Street building as part of the get out of the, the shit mission. Um, and I sold it to, to my good friend and compadre Giorgio Navas from 95 Kirum, who very gallantly at that stage came to the table to help. <coughs> We've now rented it back from Giorgio Navas <laughs> on a 10-year deal. Um, I'm looking at putting together a body of creative work together with um, Craig Leo from uh, Warhorse and all those famous places, myself, uh, Nadia Brown, um, our art department, and Valentina on performance art and all that kind of stuff. It's 2,500 square meters of a visual and an experience on understanding the costs of India and the different levels of society and how a culture works. I started my journey with India. I was doing research on service delivery in Southern Africa and um, with the Protea Hotels and a few other players. And I wanted to understand how a country was able to achieve such service, high standards of service delivery um, in a new age economy, basically. Where we in South Africa um, seem to be surviving on a grunt and point mentality, which has to at some point stop. It really does have to get, which is how I ended up on care and hope and all these other things and ended up spending a billion on a fucking campus. But <laughs> 
<clears throat> India is just, it's one of those in most unbelievable places and it has all the different elements that, um, uh, it just that life represents, you know what I mean? It's just this crazy mess of energy and space. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so we're going to build a huge big set um, behind the backs of the city council. Um, in a warehouse tucked away in an area that you've never been to. And then late one night, we're going to truck the entire thing in and we're going to drop it on the fucking roof. <laughs> and that's what we're going to do at Loop Street. <laughs> We're artists. <laughs> um, yeah, it's complicated. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Look, we, we have an amount of money saved. Um, uh, I was not looking at putting together a, a campus and a center of learning um, right now. The thing with the center of learning is it's not about the learning. It's not actually about that. It's about transport to get to and from. It's about educators and facilitators and a principal and 450 staff on a shift. And it's got to be paid for education. Therefore, you're on shift while you're there. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a job that comes with an integrated transport system, which is going to double up as a nighttime drop-off and, and pick up for clients. Um, we creating these little mini helicopters with British American tobaccos that are going to be like strippers with cigarette vending machines coming out their turbans and <laughs> their coats. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, right. But, <laughs> no, fuck. Um, but um, it was, you know, when we, we, we look at things and it's about going back to that you know, we go to the financial director and we say, hi, Mr. Dominguez, who happens to be one of our shareholders, and we say, hi, please, can we have money? And he, he just says, no, you know, it's not, a, it's not this negotiation of love. There's fuck all of that, you know. So <laughs> anyway, we went back to him and told him we're going to have Russian strippers selling cigarettes, and he loved the concept. So <laughs> when it came to the money, he still said, said no, but we went to our friends at BAT <coughs> and... What's been so amazing about Zingara is the amount of unbelievable support that we have received from the corporate industry for our work um, and for our ability to think out the box where, yeah, you know, they come and they want to put their ugly cigarette or their beautiful cigarette, depends if you smoke or not, behind the bar and it's like, oh no, Jesus Christ, we can't do that, you know. Can we please come up with something <laughs> creative? Um, yeah. <coughs> Is that it? No more dodgy questions. <laughs> um, yeah, my question is, it seems to me, you said earlier that you were sick and tired of writing out checks uh, to charity. Yes. Uh, you are sort of doing things the long, hard, and stupid way. Um, to what extent do you agree with that statement? And to what extent does that sort of set you apart from the rest of the public? Look, I, I, I say we're sick and tired of writing our checks, but we do still write our checks. But, <laughs> but um, I why did I why did I get angry about it, uh, or why did I change the way we were working? Um, I I don't know. Something inside me just said stop, and I don't know what it was but something inside me just said stop. Um, I found it very, very hard to explain myself to an organization like Ikamba. Ikamba has been looking after 20, 30,000 kids on a daily basis for the last 20 years or whatever it is. Um, and to go to Helen Lieberman and to tell her, sorry, the, the time is up, the checks are stopping, <coughs> is uh, very scary and not a very nice thing to be doing. Um, you know, we... Why? I don't know why, but I knew that there had to be a better way. When I see where, we, where we're spending our money now and I see the impact that it's making, you know, I'll give you an example. Koliswa, you know, <coughs> starts off and they have their computer course and everything else and she goes onto Facebook and it's all about Jesus Christ and God is, God is great and wada, wada, wada. Three months down the line, it's, well, I'm in the chef showcase, dudes. And to see that level of growth in someone, to see that person, like, get there, um, 
and to start thinking correctly about the control and what's important in their lives and what they can do in order to shift their life, it's a tangible subject. It's tangible for me. It's tangible not only for me, it's tangible for the 350 people that they work in with. Where we see these, these mentors of hope come into our organization and grow in so strong, both spiritually and mentally, the defining the rights and the wrongs, um, taking over kitchens, learning basic skills in leadership, and then fucking forward. I mean, just flying. Um, that for me is tangible growth. Um, <coughs> who knows? The relationships with the Cumbers and Nicros and Reach for a Dream, who's to say they're over? You with me? It's a for now thing. For me, it's a for now thing. Um, we're going to need our resources in order to achieve what we want to as a group of people, as a group of creatives. Um, we're going to need every single last cent we've got. Um, we're going to need um, our clients to, please God, continue supporting us, although we fuck up regularly, I know. Um, but I do believe there's hope. I do. I, I believe that there's got to be another way. There's got to be a, another way to shift our industry um, into this, this breeding ground for growth. 